Good evening. Trust that you've had a profitable Holy Week, and I trust you've been able to spend some time uh, following in the steps of Jesus. To, tonight we come to the Day of Unleavened Bread, or what would uh, become called uh, as Maundy Thursday, the opportunity to gather together, to, to come to the Lord's table, uh, mimicking, following the steps of Jesus and what he did uh, with the disciples. The last time we gathered together for worship, we focused upon Palm Sunday. The pastor uh, led us through uh, our sovereign, committed, uh, compassionate, uh, glorious King of Kings who triumphantly came into the city, who came from Bethany, came over the Mount of Olives, through the Kindred Valley, into the city uh, of Jerusalem, that triumphant uh, entrance into the city, riding on the colt uh, of a donkey as he was celebrated as he came into the city. He went into the city uh, that day, but he didn't spend very long. It was, uh, the day was getting long, and so he did not spend very long, and he then left the city with his disciples, and they returned in the very way that, that he came, went back through the Kindred Valley, back over the Mount of Olives, and then uh, back to Bethany. On Monday, he arose with his disciples and began that journey uh, back to uh, Jerusalem. And as he came over the, the Mount of Olives, he looked over and he saw a fig tree. He said to the, the fig tree, the fig tree had leaves but had no fruit, and he cursed the fig tree. The disciples didn't take much notice of that, at least on Monday, and so they continued on into the city. You're familiar with what happened when he came into the city. He went into the temple, and he cleansed the temple. He was infuriated. Uh, for the abuse of the temple, for the abuse of worship uh, in the temple. And so he cleansed the temple, and he declared that it would be a house of prayer for all of the nations. Upon leaving uh, there, he would spend time teaching. He would spend time answering questions. He takes and leads the disciples then, goes back over uh, through the Kindred Valley, back over the Mount uh, of Olives. On Tuesday, they return the same way, except this time, when they're coming over the Mount of Olives, Peter looks over uh, and he sees the, the, the fig tree withered, and he is surprised. And he says to, to Jesus, look, the fig tree is withered, that you cursed, it is already now uh, withered. And he, and, and he gets rebuked by uh, Jesus, basically uh, says to him that he's of little faith, encourages him to have faith in God, encourages him to walk by faith in God, and encourages him to be a man of prayer in faith to God. As they come into the city then, Jesus spends a good bit of time, and much of what you would read uh, during Holy Week in terms of the teaching and the preaching of Jesus would take place on this day in the city where he goes into the temple and where he would be questioned. He would be questioned by the, by the high priest. Many of the parables that you're very familiar with take place on this day in the city, in and around uh, the temple, where he gives the parable of the two sons, the parable of the talents, the parable of the treasures, the parable of the wedding feast, of the, of the ten virgins. He rebukes the Sadducees, and he speaks, even of this day, he speaks of the resurrection. They don't understand what he's saying uh, to them will take place in just, uh, in just a few days. This is the day that he observes the widow's offering, and he points it out to the disciples, and he teaches them about uh, the widow's offering to, to encourage them and to teach them, and then it's back to Bethany. On Wednesday, he does not come over the Mount of Olives or through the Kinder Valley to the uh, city of Jerusalem. He stays in Bethany. We're not told much of what took place uh, on Wednesday, except we do know two significant events uh, that happened on Wednesday later uh, in the day. One, he is anointed. He's anointed with expensive oil, which, as you remember, creates a controversy amongst the disciples. And the second event that takes place is the, the day that Judas goes and has a conversation and creates a, a scenario where he'll betray uh, Jesus himself, and he'll betray him uh, into the hands of those who desire uh, to crucify him. Then we come to Thursday. Now we come to that day of unleavened bread. Now we come to that, that Monday Thursday where Jesus now will take and lead and guide his disciples in, in one of the most foundational teachings uh, that they will understand, and they will pass on to us, and what is created is a command a command that gets passed on for us even this day, for us to come to the Lord's table. So we do so together. We do so led by uh, the Spirit of God, and we do so following in the steps of Jesus. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before you this evening. Lord, we come before you, and we come following our Savior. And Lord, I pray that our act of following Him in the institution of the Lord's Supper, Lord, would be reflective of our following him in every area of our life. 
as we commit to him as our King of kings and our Lord of lords. Lord, we acknowledge and recognize that we independent, uh, you have no, have no standing uh, before you apart from him, Lord. So we lift our prayers to you in, in his most powerful name. Lord, we thank you for your spirit who leads us and guides us, who empowers us, Lord, to worship you. And we ask that you would fill us with your spirit. Even as we acknowledge and confess our sins to you, Lord, we claim the forgiveness found in Christ. And Lord, would you lead us by your spirit with your word as we come to your table, as we partake in communion with you. Lord, we pray that our worship would be done in spirit and in truth. Lord, teach us, uh, we pray, to, to consider your amazing love for us. Lord, that you would send your son to die for our sins. Lord, how can it be that you would love us sinners so much? We pray all of this in the name of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand and let's sing to our God. confession of truth this evening is from the Shorter Catechism. It's the questions regarding the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? Together, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament in which bread and wine are given and received as Christ directed to proclaim his death. 
those who receive the Lord's Supper in the right way share in his body and blood with all his benefits, not physically, but by faith, and become spiritually stronger and grow in grace. What is the right way to receive the Lord's Supper? The right way to receive the Lord's Supper is to examine whether we discern the Lord's body, whether our faith feeds on Him, and whether we have repentance, love, and a new obedience so that we may not come in the wrong way and eat and drink judgment on ourselves. Please be seated. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to be with you and to come together as our Lord commanded. It's called Monday Thursday, as Bruce indicated, when he was walking us through the steps of Jesus where we have arrived on Monday Thursday. That's d download from the Latin. You get another word, mandate, from it. And that there is a command. In fact, it's a twofold command that we are to celebrate this meal in the, in the new covenant, and we are to... And the other commandment he gave to them, I uh, give you a new commandment that you love one another, and here's the newness of it, as I have loved you. The command to love one another, of course, throughout the Scripture. But now we have before us, with Christ's 33 years of life and ministry and his three years of public ministry, how we ought to love him and how we ought to love one another because of the love of Christ which sets us free from our sin. And he's given us a meal. Now, this isn't new. Uh, our Lord, actually, when we come to this meal, what we like to do, this Lord's Supper that we celebrate throughout the year, we celebrate it 10 times uh, at Briarwood with a season. Um, our focus is to create a season of communion, coming to the Lord's Supper, whether it's Lord's Day morning or Lord's Day night. But we do this one, and what we'd like to do is to see the stream of all of the Scripture as it focuses upon Christ and brings our focus to Christ, which is what the table does. It brings us back to where our foundation is for salvation. And that foundation is in Christ and Christ alone. But this supper that he instituted is not the first one. In fact, if you've got your copies of God's Word, I'd ask you to follow along with me. It's in Luke chapter 22. If you'll go there with me in Luke chapter 22. And um, I want to read for you what the, the writer of the Gospel, Luke, what he records for us about this evening. He says in Luke 22 verse 1, Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's the Passover, uh, it's described, it is defined, and it is outlined as to how it is to be done in the Pentateuch for us, specifically in the book of Exodus. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. We took note this last week, their previous plan was to kill Lazarus and stop Jesus. But after Jesus comes in on Palm Sunday, they go to plan B, which is to kill Jesus. But what they think, their plan B actually is God's plan A, that Jesus is going to go to the cross to save us from our sins, and they are a part of God's plan, even in their rebellion and in their hatred against the Messiah and in their rejection of him. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him uh, to, uh, to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Now, in other words, he's got a plan. I'm going to betray him, but where am I going to betray him? I'm going to betray him somehow where the crowd is not around. And that's what he is planning to do. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare a, the Passover for us so that we may eat it. You know, this is really interesting, isn't it? Peter and John. Now, of course, they're part of this triumphant uh, that becomes the leadership of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. 
But Peter and John, interestingly, are those who will bring forth the preparations for the last Passover and the initiation of the Lord's Supper. And as they do it, this which points to the death, the atoning death of Christ, the supper, the body and blood of the Lord, it is Peter and John who will come to the resurrection uh, and see them at, and see the empty tomb. So Peter and John, go and prepare the, the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us to prepare, to prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room or the upper room or the uh, inn it's the word katalama. It's the same word. This supper is going to be established. I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. They go to this katalama, this upper room, this guest room. In other words, if you had had a house, you'd had a second floor, and that would have been the guest room. It was open aired, and that would have been the guest room. This place, boy, I wish I had about 12 hours with you. I don't. But this place, is, of course, will become the epicenter of Christianity. This upper room. Of course, he was born in an upper room, a katalama, in Bethlehem, well, in the stable. And then they moved into, that's what they came looking for, a katalama, an inn, an upper room. They were all filled, so Jesus is born in the stable, and then in the process, they move into the house. And now he gets to the end of his life, and we're at another katalama. This isn't just anyone. It is here that Jesus will celebrate the last Passover, the first Lord's Supper. It is here that Jesus will come for the first gathered worship service on the first Lord's Day. It is here that these, many of these disciples, when they run in fear, as Jesus goes to the cross, they'll take refuge here. It is here on the resurrection that Jesus will come and be in their midst. And of course, one guy won't be there named Thomas, right? And what will happen then? Well, Jesus will come back one week later, the second Lord's Day worship service. And then Thomas will be there. And so this upper room, but the upper room's not through yet because 40 days later when Jesus ascends into heaven, he'll send them back and they'll come to this upper room. It's big enough to handle 120 people. And they'll be there in prayer, and that's where Pentecost occurs, same room. And it is there that they will continue to be found. In fact, when Peter is arrested, it's in that same room that they will be praying when he is set free. And they, the word will come to them there. What a very special place. And it is a place that it becomes very precious in the lives of the people of God. But here, we're introduced to it. The master is likely, and I think I can prove this from the Scripture pretty clearly, is likely the brother of a man named Barnabas. And he has a son named John Mark, who will be part of the first missionary team who will also be used, who will be in the garden. After this, he'll follow to the garden and will escape by running out of his robe there. It's really interesting, all the dynamics that are happening in these eight days of grace to glory, the week that changes everything. Well, he goes to the room. He says, where's the guest room? And I'll eat the Passover with my disciples, and he'll show you a large upper room furnished. Now, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, looking at the cross, where he will bear the wrath of God to save sinners by the grace of God because of the love of God and to redeem us. But before he goes there, he says, this is what I want to tell you. For I tell you, I will not eat it, this supper that he establishes. I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, pack that away in your mind just for a moment. 
And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you, from now on, I will, not dr- I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Now, he's obviously, uh, we're seeing Judas. Judas will depart. They'll have the conversation. Jesus will say, someone's going to betray me. John gives us a better, a a larger insight into this. I've often wondered um, why he picked Peter and John to go and prepare this. Wasn't Judas the treasurer? Shouldn't he pick up the check? Shouldn't he make the preparation? But what was Judas thinking about? How to betray him privately? Boy, this would have been a good opportunity if Judas had known where they were going. But Judas doesn't know. Peter and John know, but not Judas. And Judas will leave here and go out where he, to those with whom he had made the agreement for 30 pieces of silver. And after the supper is over and Jesus preaches his sermon, the, Olivet Disc- uh, the Upper Room Discourse, they'll go back over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus will hold a prayer meeting there with Peter, James, and John. And then Judas will come there. That's the time. And that's the time that he'll be betrayed. So here is is Jesus sending Judas on his way, and they begin to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Notice, who are they questioning? When Jesus says someone's going to betray me, who are they questioning? They're questioning each other. There's only one of the disciples that are sitting there that asks Jesus who it is, and that's Judas. Judas asks Jesus directly, and Jesus, of course, says, what you do, do quickly. Now's the time. Now is the time. See the sovereign hand of Christ establishing the meal whereby we can focus upon him, and every time we do it, recalibrate. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in what Christ did on the cross where the love of God met the holiness of God to save sinners by the grace of God to the glory of God. But when, he, when Jesus does this, there's a real conversion, the convergence that is taking place. This is called the Last Supper by many, And it is, in the sense, it's the last time Jesus will physically sit with them at this supper. Now, they're going to celebrate this supper regularly. But it's the last time he will, in his incarnate existence, be with them at this supper. But it's another last supper. It's the last Passover supper. And it's not only the last Passover supper, it's the first New Covenant Lord's Supper. So you've got the Passover supper that is anticipating Christ, the lamb that's slain, who cleans out the leaven that takes away our sin. It is that supper that's pointing to Christ. Now, because of what Christ does and what Christ accomplishes, what is it that we now have? We have the fulfillment, and this bloody Old Covenant Supper is fulfilled in Christ, now a bloodless, a supper that pointed to him, sacrificing. Now when he gives the sacrifice that takes away all of the sins of all of his people for all of eternity, he now gives us a new supper that points back to what he's going to do as he bears our sins in his body and sheds his blood, declaring our forgiveness of sins and clothes us with his righteousness so that we have everlasting life in him. And then he tells us, not only will he not eat it with them until he says this, but I will one day 
when I eat it anew. And there he's looking to the consummation supper, the marriage supper, when all of his people will be together with him in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that's come down. But they knew about the Passover. Jesus knew about the Passover. John himself, in the Gospel of John, takes great pains to point out. Luke takes pains to point out that Jesus' family observed the suppers and the feast regularly as he was growing up till he begins his public ministry at age 30. And then John tells us in his three years of public ministry, he intentionally celebrates the Lord's Supper every single time, every single year. John 2 is his first Lord's Supper in his public ministry. John 6 is the second Lord's Supper in his public ministry. And then John 12, where we are today, is the last time that he will do it before he goes to the cross. Bruce walked us through the eight days that we've asked you. We've sent the devotional. By the way, if you're visiting with us, and just go to the website. You can get the devotional and follow us the rest of the week until we uh, work our way through this. Next uh, Good Friday, when we go through the words that Christ utters from the cross, the seven words, the seven sayings that he makes. And we'll have that from 12 to 1 tomorrow. And then, of course, Resurrection Lord's Day. And you can follow the texts that are there for you that we've made available devotionally for everyone. But as you followed it, probably you noticed triumphal entry. Remember our study of that on the Lord's Day? And then he comes back on Monday, and he cleanses the temple. That's the second time he cleanses the temple. He did it the first year of his ministry, and now he does it again at the last year of his ministry. And then he not only cleanses the temple, the next day he is teaching in the temple. And all of these parables and all of these lessons that he gives are extraordinary. And then he gets to the end of the day on Tuesday. You'll find it in Matthew 26. I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. But you'll find it in Matthew 26, verses 1 and 2. And here's what he says to them as he finishes that day of teaching. In two days, we will celebrate the feast. And then I will be put to death and crucified. And then the next verse says, and the Pharisees were seeking how to kill him. Well, then Wednesday comes in which there is reflection and we work through what takes place on Wednesday. And then comes this day, the day, that second day from what he had stated in Matthew 26, the day of the Passover, the day of the preparations for the Passover. Peter and John are sent, and they find the place just as he has said, and so they prepare the supper. Now, what would they have done? Well, they would have properly prepared it. Now, folks, the Passover, let me just say, we've tried to, if you'd like to come up later and take a look at this, one of our pastors has put this together, and let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't do what perhaps many of you experience when you go to uh, quote-unquote satyrs that are given today. Almost all of the satyrs that I have seen that have done, they're done from, uh, they're done from downloading what uh, Jews who have been dispersed into Europe uh, in their communities, what they would do in the 19th and 18th and 17th century. What we've done is we've gone back with as much research as we can, and you, what you'll see is this is not a complicated banquet. But remember the very first Passover. Can I use our language? It was a meal to go. It was very simple. It was very intentional. And you were to eat it clothed with your staff. And you were to do exactly what all of your mothers told you to do. Eat it all. And then take your staff and follow me. Be ready to go for me. So what would have happened is whether it's a family or a synagogue or the gathering of those who would come together to celebrate the Passover, the first thing, there would be 10 steps that they would take. I'm not going through all of them, but I'll, I'll just mention a couple. There would have been 10 steps that they would have taken. Step number one would have been to prepare it. You need herbs. Let me tell you what you don't have is leaven. You make sure there's no leaven. You've got bread, and you make sure there's no leaven in that bread. You've got bread, you've got herbs, 
and you would have taken a lamb to be slain. Jesus, in the fulfillment of the slain of the Passover lamb, will do away not only with the slain of the Passover lamb at this, uh, by what he does on the cross, but he'll do away with another day called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He'll do away with both of those because of what he does on the cross for us. But you would have, in that day, you would have slain the, you know, the lamb, and then you would have brought it, or you might have divided it among others, and you would have brought it to eat, and whatever you brought had to be completely eaten. And so the table would have been set up very simply like this. The only ones allowed at the table were God's covenant people, those who bore the sign of the covenant, circumcision, and their families. And as they were gathered around there, the next thing would happen is the bapt two baptisms that were prescribed in Exodus 30. And in fact, if you didn't do them, you could be put to death according to Exodus 30. One baptism was a baptism of your hands. Now, they would have had two cloths. I've got one here. They would have had two cloths, and one cloth would have been used to wrap around the one who is going to baptize their feet. And the other one would be used to dry. The first thing they would baptize is their hands. And the way that they would do that is they would arrive, and here would be the basin. You would hold out your hands, and then they would pour, and then cleanse the hands. You would simply just hold your hands over it, and then you would... Um, and as the hands were cleansed, you remember the disciples actually would continually come under criticism because your disciples don't baptize their hands like we do, the Pharisees said. But they would have done it in this meal. They would have, had, uh, they would have, been, they would have done that with their hands. And then they would have sat down and, and then their feet would have been baptized. As another basin would be brought out, it would be put under the feet and the one would come and they would pick and they would pick the foot up and put it on the towel that wraps them, and then they would pour the water on and wash it and then set it back down in the basin. You can't imagine what your feet look like walking through a first century town, village, city. So they usually found a way to get a slave to do that. Now, it doesn't tell us, but I have no doubt they got the hand baptism done but we do know they didn't do the foot. But Jesus is going to make sure that Exodus 30 is followed. So he goes and he washes their feet. You remember Peter, don't you? <laughs> Peter realizes what's going on and Peter says, Oh, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, If I don't wash you, then you're not clean. To be right with God, I have to wash you, ultimately pointing to being cleansed by his blood. And then, of course, Peter. You always know what Peter's thinking. He didn't have a big filter. Peter then says, Lord, not my hands or my feet, but all of me. And so he declares. But what did they do at the meal? Well, after the baptism had taken place, there would be a prayer, and they would sing the Hallel. They would sing the psalm, and then they would sit down. And the appointed one, or if it's a family, the eldest son would say, Father, what means this Passover? Now remember, everything's been prepared. The lamb's been slain. The blood has been brought. And it's been put over the lintel and over both doorposts. Three strokes that the Lord would pass over the homes and those that are in it that were under the blood. Three strokes. Because our saving work is by God. Trinitarian gospel, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And after they had sung and the statement was made, what means this Passover? Then what would be stated is simply this. The entire family or group would be instructed from the book of Exodus that God 
graciously delivered us from the bondage that we were in and brought us out through a wilderness and to the promised land. And so they would be instructed, now you're ready to eat. Now you are ready to participate. Well, what they would have done, they'd have taken bread very much like this. The bread back then served as bread, uh, served as nourishment, and it also served as a fork, a spoon. And so they would dip it. When they would dip it, they might take some herbs and they would place upon it. They might even take some of the lamb and place upon it. And then they would partake. And they would then go through the meal. The meal would begin with the first cup of wine. The wine would be the fruit of the vine, and as was their practice, it likely would have been new wine. That means it, uh, very, little, uh, very little alcoholic fermentation time had taken place. And furthermore, it would have been, um, it would have been um, diluted by three cups of water for every one cup of wine. And then they would have partaken of it. They would have drank the cup. They would have eaten the meal, and uh, having been instructed, and after the meal, they would then take a second cup, and then they would sing a hymn to go out. But at this point, Jesus stops. And after the second cup has been taken, he takes the bread, and he says, this is my body which is given for you. And then he broke it, and he passed it to his disciples, and they would partake. Now, it's obvious that this isn't the physical body of Jesus, as some even today would say, because what? <laughs> Where is Jesus' physical body? It's right there. This is anticipating the work of redemption, and we partake of the benefits of what he does with his body, and we spiritually feast upon him and all that he has done to take our sins away. And then he takes the third cup. And when he gets the third cup, it's also poured. And after pouring it, he then says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. And then he says, this a little bit of grammar work here. He doesn't say, drink it all, as some have said. He doesn't say, drink. if he said, drink it all, and you put it to the first guy, what happens? Nobody else is going to get anything. Actually, the proper translation is, all of you drink it. We all are saved by the work of Christ as his body bears our sins, and we partake, reminding us that by faith and repentance, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And it is his blood that wipes away all of our sins so that we are clothed with the righteousness of God. This meal looked to Christ, anticipated him. The meal he establishes for us is even more simple. The new covenant meal, the bloodless meal, is even more simple, but how gloriously profound. In fact, if you don't mind, I'm going to read one more passage, and then we will make our way to the meal appropriately. If you've got your copies of God's Word and you'd like to follow along with me, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And when you get there, I want to uh, read for you what is called the words of institution, as the Apostle Paul gives us the insight into this meal. He says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, and I'm just going to read at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This meal pointed to Jesus. And that's where the new covenant meal is pointing you back to Jesus and what he did on the cross to save you from your sins. He didn't just overcome a tyrannical ruler named Pharaoh. He defeated Satan, sin, death, hell, and the grave. He didn't just bring us out of the bondage of the slavery of men. He takes us and delivers us out of the bondage of our sin. You can be right with God, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You can be set free from the power of sin, not only declared innocent, justified, because he takes away your sin and gives you his righteousness. This table is also telling you he breaks the power of sin and regeneration. You can be born again, and you may still have sin living in you, and yes, you do, but you no longer live under the dominion of sin. And now you're set free to live for him. You see, it's so easy for us to think it's what we do that saves us or allows God to save us. This table keeps reminding you, you have been set free to do for Jesus, but you don't do for salvation. He's done it. This table keeps putting you back to your foundation. We have been delivered from sin's penalty, power. We have been delivered from, we are being delivered from its practice, and one day there's another supper coming in which we will be delivered from the presence of sin. And it's because of Christ. That's what is taking place on this glorious night. And that's where we're being pointed. So it is my great privilege as a minister of the gospel to invite you to the new covenant meal that has been mandated by our Savior so that we will know what it means to love one another as he has loved us. And so we know what it means to tell a lost world that's searching for any and every answer that are all empty and futile, that there is one who doesn't love sin, but he does love sinners. And there is one in his enmity against sin defeated it for you so that you as a sinner can come to him and be set right with God and God come right within you. That's the glory of what this supper recalibrates us. That old covenant meal, remember, he delivered you. Clean out the leaven, repent, and then take your staff and follow me. The new covenant meal, remember the body and blood of Jesus. Clean out the leaven. Examine yourself and repent. You're free to confess your sins. You can be honest about sin and confess it because you're not being saved by how well you do. You're being saved by what he did. And now you can preach the gospel and live the gospel until he comes again. That's where our meal is pointing us. So just as they would have invited those who are in the covenant with the sign of the covenant circumcision, then all of you who are in Christ, I invite you to this meal today. Those who have been circumcised in Christ, he has cut out your old heart and given you a new heart. He has cut out your sin and nailed it to the cross. He is your circumcision. So all baptized Members of the body of Christ who are in Christ. You don't have to be a member of Briarwood. You're invited. You don't have to be a part of the Presbyterian Church in America, which we're a part of. You're invited. This is the Lord's table, not just one, ele well, one element of his church. This is the Lord's table. And if you're in Christ, Christ is in you, and you belong to him, and you reside in his people and with his people, then this is the covenant meal to refresh and renew you. Remember, repent, and be renewed in your foundation in Christ and your life now for Christ. I invite all of you.
If you have children here who have not yet publicly professed Christ and been joined into the body of Christ, then you can do with this meal what God's covenant people did with the Passover meal as they used the meal to instruct their children of a God who delivers them, that they might come to Christ. This meal cannot convert anybody. This meal confirms and calls us first back to our foundation, Christ and Him crucified. Then forward to live for Him and then one day be with Him because the Christ who was crucified for our sins and buried arose on the third day. And thus we shall be with him forever. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you so much that we can come to this table. The very simplicity of it. The body of our Savior. The blood of our Savior. And Father, we can rejoice in serving you. Would you come, Holy Spirit? And we have done as they did in the old covenant. We come to the meal with instruction. And then, because we want to partake of Jesus by faith, and faith comes by the hearing of your word. But now, Father, we want to, by faith, see what our Savior has done. Hear from him the assurance of salvation for all who are in Christ. And then see and hear what he calls us to do for him because the love of Christ compels us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn of preparation, but I would first say this to you. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. And then, after breaking it and giving thanks as we have done, and to set these elements aside, he would instruct us to take it as we will tonight. He then took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. And we set this aside with prayer. Two distinct actions at the table, the bread and the cup. All of you in Christ come and partake. Let's prepare our hearts with a glorious hymn of praise to our God. The Hallel pointed to him. This hymn will, pre will prepare us to exalt the one who has come for us and is coming again. Amen. One of the ways that we come cleaning out the leaven is to confess our sins. And he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you join me so that together, as God's people, we can have our corporate confession? Then if you'd like to use that, I'd like to give you some moments for personal confession. Remove all of those obstacles 
of your intimacy with the Lord and your freedom to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, led by the Word of God, so that the glory of God is your greatest joy in life. Join me, if you would, in the confession that you will have in front of you together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Against you, you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Would you take a few moments now in silent prayer and confession before the Lord? Father, here are elements that literally for thousands of years you have ordained to be used for a sacred purpose, very ordinary elements for an extraordinary purpose. So with your word guiding your people, may these elements display before them and by touch encourage them and even as they ingest them, May they be renewed in their souls as they ingest with a renewed spirit and a renewed mind the majesty and glory and the sufficiency of their Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of pardon truly, truly. He who believes in me has eternal life. Praise his name forever. Now, we like to come to the table normally to sit, but what we're going to do is have the elements appropriately and, and safely provided for you, and you come through individually and distanced appropriately. That's, of course, how you will handle it. And then as you come through, you just return to your seat, and please hold them so that we can partake of them together, uh, even as they were passed to his disciples. For we are saved as one body in Christ. You come into the kingdom one by one, but we live for Christ as his people, his church, to the glory of his name. So if you'll hold it and spend that time in thoughtful focus upon Christ, even as his word is ministered in music and even as you can take these moments to fix your minds and your hearts on him who loves you, who gave himself for you. Amen.
If there's anyone who has not yet served, please come forward. And I'd ask the elders to make sure that you have received the elements and you may take your places. Our Lord, when he had given the bread, he said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. And then he said, all of you take this 
and eat it. And after they had taken the bread, he passed the cup. Having taken the bread in remembrance of him, then the cup. He made it abundantly clear where this pointed. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then he said, this blood has been shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. And he said, now, all of you, drink it. The Bible is abundantly clear that they were not yet through yet. They were going to be dismissed by the Lord. He gave quite an instruction, a whole sermon. It's called the Upper Room Discourse. And it would end with one of the greatest things you can read, John 17, the high priestly prayer, where he prayed for his people. And then they'll go out and they'll go across into the Garden of Gethsemane for an extended prayer meeting, and he'll be arrested. He will be sent to six trials, three Jewish three Gentile. He will go to the Garden of Gethsemane, draw his disciples around for a prayer. And then I want you to think about this. Here is the one who in the boat was perfectly at peace while seasoned fishermen on the Sea of Galilee were frightened, thinking they were going to perish. That same Savior in the garden will even cry out, is there another way? If there be any other way, Father, take this cup from me. He knows what he is about to face for us. The unadulterated wrath of God against all of our sin. And it is there that even in the intensity of the moment, his capillaries would burst. And the sweat and the blood would flow mingled but he will fulfill what the Father had sent him to do, to go to that cross. On that cross, he'll give seven statements. We'll follow them tomorrow in a time of remembrance of our Savior on the cross and what he said from 12 into 1. It is our habit at Briarwood to encourage and to continue to expand our mercy ministry so as you are so led on your way out, you may give our alms offering that is used fully for our mercy ministry, which we do at the conclusion of our communion services, as the Lord would so lead you. Now, would you stand so that we may sing to the praise of God, followed by the benediction. love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now until he comes again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And God's people said?
Amen.